It's a pleasure to introduce Joe Duraney, who's um, chair of the division of um, cardiac surgery at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, Joe is a true brother in arms for me, and he's made enormous contributions to pediatric and adult cardiothoracic surgery. And uh, Joe, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Well, th thank you. Before you start the clock, I, I feel the need to give a shout out to Dr. Bailey because I think I'm the only surgical disciple of his here in the audience. And I've had the wonderful opportunity to train in wonderful environments in Boston and Washington, D.C., in Rochester, Minnesota. But my fondest memory, sincerely, were, was my fellowship in pediatric heart surgery at Loma Linda with Dr. Bailey. Dr. Bailey, you had an impact and an influence on me and my professional career that you probably don't appreciate, but from the bottom of my heart, thank you. So I don't look at, the, uh, at all of these innovators and innovations as necessarily one being more important than the other. And uh, because the fact of the matter is, is this meeting that we're here at right now is uh, in, in every way, shape, and form due to all of the innovators and all of the innovations that occurred through good times and through bad times. But what's really fun to hear about are the stories. And of course, I, I am anchored in Rochester, Minnesota, and many of you know that a lot of cardiac surgery origins started there. And so. I had the good fortune to learn a lot about Dr. John Kirkland. And Dr. John Kirkland, I think many of you know, is viewed as really one of the forefathers of cardiac surgery. And so I learned a lot about him when I was there. So I don't expect you to be able to read this note, but um, these are the minutes that Dr. Kirkland presented in 1952 to the scientific committee at the Mayo Clinic making a plea to let him use a heart-lung machine to help fix intracardiac defects, citing all of the failures that had occurred in Philadelphia previously. So in usual Mayo Clinic fashion, it took three years to get this off the ground and get approved. And so in 1955, the very first survivor that was discharged from the hospital was a five-year-old girl uh, that had VSD closure. And she is alive and well today. This was her um, at her fifth birthday. And she is alive and well as of two weeks ago. Now, this is the first operative note from that operation. For any of you that know or knew of John Kirkland, he was very particular about English grammar. And he was very particular about the words that he selected when he spoke and when he wrote. And this caption from the very first no is really interesting to read. And I just will read this one excerpt. And I think you will get to appreciate what, these, what, what he went through in the very first period. The left subclavian artery was exceedingly difficult to cannulate. It was finally necessary to do so after transecting it. I am really certain that there was kinking beyond our cannula. As a result of this, the pump pressure rose very, very high, and the arterial line from the machine blew off the adapter by which it was attached in the subclavian cannula. Because of the time taken to remedy this and get the air out of the line, it was a six-minute period during which there was no flow. Fortunately, the patient's body temperature was 30 degrees at this time. When circulation was reestablished, her condition improved and satisfactorily stabilized. At the time of this dictation, her general condition is excellent. She is waking up, her heart rate is good, and the chances for recovery should be excellent. So those were the, those were the tough times. Now, this is the first perfusion record. And, and it's handwritten, and it was written in ink, but you can see it's faded. But the thing that I want to draw your attention to is that in order to prime that heart-lung machine that you saw, it was 1,500 cc's of blood. Now, this is Rochester, Minnesota. And I think many of you know what the weather is like in Rochester, Minnesota. This is a beautiful day in Rochester, Minnesota, with six inches of snow on the ground. But in March, when Dr. Kirkland started this program, we have snow sometimes up until May. And I had the good fortune of meeting some patients 
who would walk to the hospital as far as 10 miles away, leaving their homes at two and three o'clock in the morning to get to St. Mary's Hospital to donate their blood to a stranger so that Dr. Kirkland could do heart surgery on them. So when people ask me why I live in Rochester, Minnesota, I tactfully remind them that the people in Rochester, Minnesota and in the Midwest in general are authentic, they are caring. And while we see people like that all around the world, it's been hard for me to go back to the East Coast or the West Coast after being in this environment for 20 years. So thank you to Dr. Kirkland for being an innovator and thank you to the technology of cardiopulmonary bypass for being a major innovation in our specialty.